Hi, in this video I will discuss my initial impressions with verbatim polypropylene filament for FDM printing. After a quick introduction I will show some test prints and discuss which settings I used to print the material on my FlashForge streamer. Polypropylene is a very commonly used thermoplastic polymer. It is used in many applications like packaging, automotive industry, for making toys, ropes, etc. Polypropylene is very popular because it combines high chemical and heat resistance with desirable material properties like fatigue resistance and toughness. These mechanical properties make it very suitable for making parts with living hinges. The toughness of the material can easily be made visible by subjecting the material to stress. After some initial elastic deformation, the material quickly starts to show plastic deformation. This also happens with living hinges, the first time they are bent. The outer layer of the material stretches to accommodate the full bend, after which the material relies on ex extremely good fatigue resistance to allow for countless bends without tearing or breaking the material. Verbatim offers a polypropylene filament in 1.75 and 3 mm diameters. You can choose any color as long as it is natural transparent. The recommended temperature for the extruder is 220 degrees C and for the heated bed 100 degrees C is recommended. Polypropylene tape can be used on the heated bed to achieve proper adhesion. Verbatim recommends double-sided tape, but since I did not have that available, I use standard packing tape, which is typically made from polypropylene as well. My heated bed is fitted with build tack, so I use the glass plate to allow me to easily apply and remove the tape. The glass plate adds around 3 mm of thickness to the bed. A shim can be used to offset the Z-homing position with the correct distance. I printed several shims which were slightly different thickness and used the printer control software to find the correct offset. The program allows you to move the Z-axis in small increments and find the Z-value at which the micro switch triggers. I will share the model of the shim on my website, link in the description below. I'm using a flash for Dreamer from 2014, which is not particularly well suited for printing with flexible materials. Although the verbatim polypropylene filament is not as soft as TPU, I would at least say it's semi-flexible material. Aside from all metal hot ends, I still have the original extruder assembly fitted to my machine. There are molds available for better guiding the flexible filament, but it turned out the material extruded without buckling, even at the higher speeds when feeding the material, so I decided to give it a try. When printing actual parts, there were issues with retractions and higher feed rates. I will show details on those issues later on in the video. One of the most important things I wanted to test with this material was to see if I could print a fully functional living hinge. As a test case for the living hinge, I started with a small box, just to test the design geometry. The hinge geometry I used has typical dimensions as one might also use for an injection molded part. The thinnest section will show plastic deformation when closing the hinge. The recessed area, which in this case is 0.50 mm deep, makes sure the part still closes tightly close to the hinge, allowing for some added height from the deformed hinge in the closed position. The thickness at the center of the hinge is 0.4 mm. This would mean at the thinnest part of the hinge two layers would be used when printing at 200 microns layer height. I used a smaller layer height of 140 microns for the sample print, which resulted in three layers for the hinge. The radius at the bottom allows for a gradual increase of the stress towards the center of the hinge while still making sure it bends at the right location. On the sides of the hinge, an inward fillet is used to increase the tear resistance. The hinge seemed to work fine in the first test. It was possible to bend the hinge 180 degrees and even after many consecutive bends, there still did not seem to be any sign of fatigue or tearing. Now it was time to test the hinge geometry on a functional part, so I decided to design a back clip. Back clips are very useful for closing plastic bags, making them more or less airtight for conserving food. The hinge in these types of parts are typically used many times and are more exposed to large amounts of stress, so they are a good test case for assessing the durability of the living hinge. I went through several design iterations before ending up with this model, which has enough stiffness without becoming too bulky. The first print wasn't really a complete success. Cooling was not sufficient at the high part of the back clip, resulting in a droopy mess. A possible fix for this would be to print two or more back clips at the same time, 
allowing the plastic to cool down sufficiently before the next pass. But I don't like printing two parts when I only need one. Another option was to provide sufficient cooling, which is what I used at the second attempt. This model was printed with the part cooling fan turned on, which gives much better results. I did keep the lid on the build chamber to minimize the chance of warping. In the various test prints I performed, I used extruded temperatures between 190 degrees C and 220 degrees C, all seemed to work well. The bed temperature was set to 50 degrees C, which is lower than the recommended temperature of 100 degrees C, but it seemed to work fine for this part. For larger prints, uh, a higher bed temperature may be beneficial. The feed rate was set to 30 mm per second, which is quite slow, but it gives far better results than 50 mm per second, which I also tested. Maybe a printer better suited to printing flexible materials can achieve good quality at higher speeds. Because the back clip was positioned in line with the x-axis, the hinge was printed at 45 degree angles, which are perpendicular to each other for each new layer. Although the setup was kind of accidental and caused by the default infill angle of flash print, it works quite well. The 45 degree angle can be seen under a microscope. It almost looks like a braided piece of fabric or shoelaces. The radius on the side of the hinge for the increased tear resistance is copied quite well from the CAD design to the part. Even at larger overhangs, the print quality is still reasonable. Although I think the design can still be improved, the current version works quite well and is a nice showcase for useful prints that can be made from polypropylene. The latest model can be downloaded for free from my website uptimefab.com. Of course, I also printed the inevitable Benchy. The settings for this model were 220 degrees C for the extruder, 50 degrees C for the bed and 140 micron layer height. This is a good example of how the printing speed affects the surface quality as I mentioned earlier. This first model is printed at 50 mm per second, especially at the front of the Benchy, where there is a steep overhang, the print quality is not really acceptable. The Benchy printed at 30 mm per second, the model on the right, has a significantly improved surface finish. For this reason, I decided to stick with the lower printing speed. As you can see, both models have a large gash on the side. I think this has to do with retraction, so this may or may not be solved when tweaking retraction settings. Since I did not notice this defect on any of my other models, I decided to look at this at some point in the future. One thing I noticed on the back clips was that the quality of the edges of the part really suffered when printing at 200 micron layer heights instead of 140 micron layer heights. This may be due to the flow rate being higher and therefore harder to control around sharp corners. Also, the 140 micron setting uses three layers for the walls of the part instead of two. This would also make it less critical if there are any extrusion issues since they are smaller and more easily compensated by the two other passes. Regardless of the cause, it does show that it pays off to try various print settings with this material. My next project was to design a larger box with living hinges. In order to make the hinge open easily without having to deform the entire lid, I went for a design with a latch that is also connected using a living hinge. As you can see here in the CAD model, I designed the lid and the hinge in such a way that the entire part can be printed without supports. The box, the lid and the latch are all touching the bed and the hinges are horizontal. Because of this setup, the hinge between the box and the lid is shifted upwards to a specific point that allows the lid to close properly. For this box, I used the same hinge geometry as the one I used for the back lid. After some design iterations, I now have one that works quite well. The locking part only needs some touch-up with a knife and the box closes properly. I did find that for 3D printing I was a bit over enthusiastic with regards to the locking mechanism. For injection molded parts, typically very small notches are used to latch onto the box in order to close it firmly, even with an audible click. For 3D printed parts, the locking geometry should be more simple and larger in order to be able to use parts straight from the printer without rework. The current model of this box is also downloadable from my website at uptimefab.com. I've printed several of these boxes uh, and during one of the prints the window was open as usual for ventilation, but this time on a very windy day. Because I used spacers between the housing of the printer and the lid, this caused a draft inside the printer, which in turn caused some very heavy warping on the side of the part. So this is something to keep in mind when printing with this material. Make sure you have enough ventilation for health reasons, but also in a way 
that it does not create a draft that could ruin your print. These first test prints with the verbatim polypropylene material show that it can be very useful for printing functional parts, but it may also take some trial and error to get it working on your 3D printer. I have not fully mastered the art of printing with this material yet, but I hope this information was useful for you nonetheless. If you have any questions or want to share some tips or tricks, please do so in the comment section below. Thanks for watching.